Freedom Files. Freedom Files. Tuesdays and Thursdays from 5 to 7. And Saturdays from 9 to 11. Central. On American Freedom Radio. 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 Welcome back to the show. You are listening to Freedom Files live three days a week. Tuesdays and Thursdays from 5 to 7. And, of course, the Saturday night show from 9 to 11. Don't forget about our website, freedomfiles.us. And we are joined now by Bill Steele, the writer and director of such films as The Money Masters, the classic, the website, moneymasters.com. And, of course, his brand-new film. This one really opened my eyes, by the way, to you know, a lot of my you know, preconceived notions regarding the economy and you know, the way we look at money. Uh, the Secret of Oz, the website, secretofoz.com. Bill, welcome to the show. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I mean, I've I got to be honest. I mean, up until recently, before watching your film, I mean, I was a big you know, supporter of the Gold Standard because, you know, I'm a big fan of Ron Paul. I supported him back in 2007, 2008. I, I still love the guy, and that's one of the things he's been pushing is, you know, putting us back on the Gold Standard. But after watching your film and, and realizing that, that the powers that be basically have control of the gold standard that that seems to be kind of defeating the purpose going going back to that system yeah it's uh if you only uh take your your investigations of american history back to uh, 1913 when the federal reserve act was passed then it's easy to fall for the deception but uh if you go back uh just another 20 years back into the last decade of the 1800s, then you get into the period where uh, William Jennings Bryan ran against William McKinley uh, in the 1896 presidential contest, and of course McKinley was known as the gold money candidate, Bryan was known as the silver money candidate, and you, then you start to see just th this whole gold money theory totally starts to fall apart. And of course, then if you go even further back in history, then you see time and time again that every time we've gone to a gold-only money system, the middle class suffers, the rich guys get richer, and freedom perishes. Absolutely, and and you know I don't, I don't have anything against gold. I have you know a little bit of gold myself, but the, the reality is, I mean, most people cannot afford, uh, you know, $1,200 an ounce for gold, but on the other hand, a lot of people can easily afford to put their money into uh, silver dollars, you know, $20 a piece. That's not as bad as $1,200 an ounce. Right. Well, that's where I've got, that's where I've got my uh, kind of emergency money is in old junk silver dollars, uh, quarters and halves and dimes. But, I mean, I, I don't care if you invest in gold or you invest in silver. You know, it's a good backup emergency investment. But you absolutely cannot back your money with a commodity, with any sort of a commodity. Why back your money? I mean, just think of what the term means. We're going to back our money. Why back it? All that does is give the rich guys club of the world the opportunity to buy up all the backing and control the entire money system again. You're absolutely right, Bill. Now, one thing, I mean, I'm a big history buff, but the one thing that I, I never learned in history class was the Roman Republic about their system, about how they had bronze and copper, you know, for trade before the rise of Julius Caesar. And that was, that's something I found astonishing because in the film The Secret of Oz, you, you lay down how, how that, that system of currency worked perfectly. Yeah, that's it. Uh, this uh, che it's called cheap money, money that's not based on gold or silver. Every time, every single time in history, when cheap money has been deployed, it works great for the middle class. It works great for freedom. You cannot name a single example when that when it has not worked as long as the quantity is controlled. That is the key issue: that the quantity is controlled, so you don't run up you so you don't debase the money uh, and number two the second key thing is who controls that quantity if it's the bankers the rich guys club of the world then inevitably uh, your your uh, system will devolve from a democracy or a republic into a plutocracy ruled by the rich yeah exactly and that's that's the problem because I think you know, a lot of us in the movement, you know, who do see the Federal Reserve as this evil entity, and it is, uh, fail to realize that 
the, the gold standard is, is definitely not the way to go. And, and another thing that really intrigued me about this film, The Secret of Oz, I mean, there's, there's several things, and we're going to break all of it down, is the idea of the debt-free money system. And I never heard about this before your film. Well, you know, there's, when we were doing the Money Masters, I, uh, I, I finished the first cut in the editing room. I decided, well, you know, I'm going to send this to some professor of economics just to be sure I'm not way off track. And so uh, I've been a reporter all my life. I knew how to get in touch with professors. You just call the, uh, the press office of the university and you say, hey, I need to talk to this professor. And you don't try to contact him directly. You let the press office contact him. And sure enough, so I, I, I decided I'd try for Milton Friedman. You know, first off, Nobel Prize winning economist. He was at Stanford University. I called the Stanford press office. Uh, the next day, ring, ring, on the phone. It's Milton Friedman himself. And I said, you know, I've got this... Uh, documentary on the economy i'd like you to take a look at it and tell me where i've gone wrong he said sure no problem he gave me an address i fedexed it to him about two or three days or a weekend later a weekend passed uh ring ring milton friedman's back on the phone and i'll never forget these first words that he said he was by, he was in his mid-80s by then he was kind of grouchy and he goes boy if you kill the fed and don't do anything about fractional reserve lending you've done nothing and that really, he understood the problem to a much greater depth, of course, than I did. And that we had to change the, the money masters all around to include that concept as best as we could. That, you know, if you just kill the Fed, you've done nothing. The Fed isn't the problem. The Fed is just the gatekeeper, the front man, the lobbying group for the largest commercial banks. It's the ability of the largest commercial banks to loan money they don't have and charge us interest on it that is the core of the problem. Number one, it consolidates all the wealth of the country into their hands. Number two, with that wealth, they can buy every single congressman in Congress. That's the cycle we have to break. If we just kill the Fed mindlessly without understanding what's behind the Fed, we have done nothing. Exactly. And even if we do, like you were saying, if we kill the Fed, I mean, what's to stop another Bank of North America or another first, second, third, or, or fourth uh, Bank of the United States coming into power? All you're doing is just, you know, stop, you know, chopping off one head of this hydra. Right. They'll just call it something else. They'll, they'll call it the, the uh, Obama's Monetary Reform or whatever commission, and they'll just keep on doing the same thing or allow, allow the large banks to keep doing the same thing. Exactly, and that's that's what people need to realize. This has happened over and over again throughout. You know, even I mean, even if you just look at our 200-year history, with first the Bank of North America, then the first Bank of the United States, and the second Bank of the United States, and now the Federal Reserve, it's it's just a you know a, a perfect example of history repeating itself. But the good news is, nowhere in the world, nowhere in history, have a people figured out this problem better than in America and have fought against it so successfully as we have in America. It's changed hands back and forth seven different occasions throughout American history, and now they've had the power, the money power, for almost a hundred years. And we'll, we'll talk about the, the, uh, uh, the ju biblical jubilee, which, uh, which was that uh, 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 all debts had to be forgiven every 50 years. So we've gone double that. So that's why we're running into this problem. The Sumerians learned that if you don't uh, forgive debts every 50 years, the civilization will collapse. And that's what's going on. They've now accumulated so much money, such a huge proportion of the American wealth into their hands that this system is going to collapse. Absolutely. I mean, you, you look at the way our, our debt is now. We're trillions upon trillions of dollars in debt. And we're not the only country that's in debt. I mean, you have the European Union collapsing. Uh, even, even China is struggling right now. We, we've reached a point in world history that we've never hit before, and that's called debt saturation. Uh, at this point, we're jumping up uh, our national debt like a trillion, a trillion and a half, two trillion dollars a year. Uh, you know, the interest payments on this debt by the end of Obama's term are going to be just in interest, a trillion dollars a year. That's money that we pay to essentially, be, to primarily, the majority of it, to big bankers to rent our money. That's all that it is. That's what the national debt is. When you see these politicians on TV every single day saying, well, we've got to cut back 
back our spending so we can pay down the national debt. You know automatically they do not have a clue as to what the national debt is. To pay down the national debt means you would have to take money out of our system. And uh, who can afford that right now? Who in your listening audience could afford, for example, a 25% pay cut? Cut No one. But we would have a 25% national pay cut if we paid down the national debt 25%. They're interlinked because we're on a debt money system. That's what we have to kill. We have to eliminate this ability of the U.S. government to borrow money. That, that was Jefferson's primary, primary complaint about the Constitution. No more national debt should be the mantra that we carry on to our children. And uh, speaking of children, a few months ago I came across this article that basically did an estimate and said every child born now in the United States is automatically born with a, you know, a, a $30,000 debt price tag added to them. Well, uh, I, I couldn't agree with it more. I mean, debt is the problem. The national debt is the problem. Our consumer debt is the problem. And it's all because, hey, guess what? These big banks have given to been given total control over the money supply. And Obama, just a month ago, uh, said, said that instead of even having any reserve requirement, that what we should do is kill the reserve requirement entirely. In other words, the banks would have absolutely no limitation about how much money they created, and it wouldn't be so bad if they were just creating it, if, but they're creating it and loaning it to us at interest. We are literally renting our money supply. I know, and that's the problem, because, it, I mean, I heard some scuttlebutt the other day about how the Fed's considering uh, releasing more money into the system, but like, you, like you've been saying all along, it's, it's not debt-free money. It's, it's money that's tied to debt and loans and whatnot, and it's, and it's only going to make a bad situation worse in the end. It's ridiculous. You see it you, every single day these congressmen get on TV and, and just say this nonsensical stuff about the debt and how, uh, well, the, you know, the printing presses are running wide open in Washington. There are no printing presses. That it would be bad enough if that was the case, if they were just printing money. We are borrowing money. We're not printing it. That's right. I mean, that's, that's, that's you know, a big part of what's wrong with not only our country but with the rest of the world right now i mean we're we're overspending we're we're borrowing all this this bad money you know <laughs> from the federal reserve and uh bill still is my guest right now uh he is the writer director of the uh films uh the money masters and uh, his latest film the secret of oz and uh before we get into the uh, backstory of the secret of oz how you came across uh, the symbolisms in the in the book, uh, the Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Uh, let's talk about the uh, biblical jubilee real quick. Yeah, well, the Sumerians, uh, two thousand years before Bible times, discovered that uh, civilizations would collapse every fifty years if debts were not forgiven. And so, the only debts that were not forgiven were debts owed by uh, foreign travelers, foreign merchants traveling in in and out of the country. But all other debts were forgiven. So, you know, as it came time to the biblical uh, to the the jubilee period where debts would be forgiven, of course, it was very difficult to loan money because the debts were going to be forgiven. But, I mean, it was just a natural cycle, a 50-year cycle of humanity uh, that worked very well. And, uh, like I said, you know, we've, we've now been on this, uh, this Federal Reserve System for almost 100 years, so that's double the biblical jubilee period, and it's going to crush not only our economy, but the world economy. Make no mistake about it. Uh, I, <laughs> there is absolutely no hope of fixing the U.S. economy outside of this monetary reform solution. Um, it, and, and it's primarily because of four great misconceptions. I don't know if you're going to a break now you, or you want me to lay them out right now. Yeah, uh, we, we still got about uh, four minutes to our first break. All right. Well, there, there are four great misconceptions that we have to get over if we're going to get at the truth or get at the real solution. And you hear these all the time. The first one is reducing our government spending is going to fix the problem. It's not going to fix the problem. Number one, it's not going to happen. This is not the answer. The answer is much deeper than that. It's to change the debt money system that causes uh, all this spending and causes the interest on that spending to accumulate to where now it's a quarter of everything we spend is just spent on debt service for nothing more than renting our money.